I'm going to share the screen now and bring my presentation up. It's awesome. Like and after we'll get going. So this is the unofficial last event of the inauguration ce celebrations tonight. <laughs> Tom, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is a little. Tom Hanks is a little too busy right now with in DC, so I decided to. So um, we're being recorded. I'll go ahead and mute myself if everyone just wants to mute themselves. Um, and then Richard, you can kind of set the parameters as far as like questions and stuff. How do, would you prefer that uh, they type those into chat or just ask as they come up? Yeah, what we'll do is that we'll do question and answer after the presentation. Okay. Sounds and, awesome. And then we'll just, we'll uh, stop the sh share and then go back to the, where we can see everybody. Right on. So th this has um, been a passion of mine, obviously, uh, Southwest uh, Jewelry. In the previous two episodes, the first one was how the Navajo, you know, left their homeland, were put on reservations and adapted Mexican silversmithing to create kind of an indigenous style. Uh, second one was how with the birth of the railroad and road systems allowing people in the east to travel west, how we kind of created the, the tourist trade. And that kind of led to uh, a, a really fortunate event in the 70s where we had a, a thing called the turquoise boom. And so what this um, is really dedicated to is that uh, whenever you have a boom, you have really good um, people rise through that to kind of make a name for themselves. So what we're gonna to feature today is jewelry that was made from basically 1969 to the present. And these are the people that are really uh, um, added something that I would call contemporary. So they broke from the traditional style, they developed their own contemporary style and they brought it to a global stage and uh, Many of these artists are still producing. We had a field trip two years ago to the Gene Autry. Many of these artists that you're gonna to see today were actually at that show with booths, with uh, uh, jewelry on display. So this is a really passion of mine and I'm very happy to kind of share with you what I consider some of the leading people that are producing jewelry and lapidary right now in the Southwest jewelry space. Um, when we talk about this, um, we're gonna kind of go over a couple different things tonight. One, we're gonna talk about how the late 60s, the rock movement made native jewelry super hip. And we're gonna talk about how that kind of created a fashion uh, stage for the jewelry. Uh, we're gonna go back and look at the work of Kenneth Begay who in the 50s started a whole program called Navajo Modernism. Why I'm using the date 1969 was in 68, he started teaching this style at a community college uh, uh, near Shiprock. And many young artists joined this movement and you're gonna see how they were able to take his teachings and, and build upon it to make something that's uniquely theirs. We're gonna talk about the Picasso of Southwest uh, Jewelry, Charles Lolama, who was not Navajo, but rather Hopi, and how he uh, set the stage. Uh, he was collected um, uh, through deep contacts that he had in Japan and in the US and in Europe. So he created a, a world stage for this jewelry. Um, whenever you have a movement, you need to have PR. And the thing that really fueled it and uh, was in 1972, the Wall Street Journal basically published an article that said turquoise was more valuable than diamonds. And what happened was, is that you created um, the uh, network of fine jeweler, jeweler and uh, stones where people were buying them for investment purposes. And out of that came the, landmark 1974 Arizona highways that 
showcase many of these artists and many of these minds. Uh, we're gonna talk about a very prominent book called the Navajo Jewelry Book that was published in 1995 that uh, basically went in and looked at this first generation of artists. And then what we're gonna do is talk about, you know, people who are still producing today. You could go out and directly contact them and buy their jewelry. And we're gonna talk about how uh, many astute galleries, probably the most prominent being Waddell Gallery in Scottsdale, basically uh, set the standard for featuring these people as being the, the top in their game. So, these are the points that we're going to go over today, but at the end, I'm going to give this uh, talk uh, a name, and it's called Bling. You're going to see some of the most beautiful jewelry ever made by Native American hands in this presentation. And it's, it's really something that I hope that when you get through with this, you can really appreciate how this is a, a very rarefied art form now that's on a global stage. So let's talk about uh, Kenneth Begay. This was from the last presentation. Um, he had a, a brother and he had three cousins and they went into in the 1950s and started to work for a gallery called White Hogan uh, in Scottsdale. And what they did is that they took the traditional style of jewelry and they gave it a Danish uh, modern perspective where they basically eliminated a lot of the adornment that was associated with squash blossom necklaces and uh, concha belts. And what they did is they started doing these very uh, simplistic designs. What you see here on the left uh, is a, a set of a ring, earrings, a bracelet and jewelry, all done with just strictly uh, silver. On the right, you see one of the most beautiful mines from Nevada called the Fox Mine, a very simple uh, bracelet uh, made using uh, this stone. So again, he wanted to get away from what the, the trading posts were doing around him and create this aesthetic that you could break away from the traditional jewelry and make something more modern. And um, he, um, ran the, the White Hogan till about 1967. And then um, he went back to the reservation and started teaching at a community college uh, right outside of the Window Rock, Ship Rock area. And um, he became uh, very famous. The man who taught me jewelry in the 70s actually went out and took classes with him. So this man, I have, you know, very much I hold dear to my style. But what you see is very clean lines, uh, very different than um, traditional uh, jewelry. And he was very active for 10 years. We're gonna talk about some of his illustrious students also that came out of this uh, teaching program. Um, the other person that we talked about is Joe Herrera Quintana. Uh, he was very active in 1915 uh, to 1991, was, was his life. Um, but from the 30s, <coughs> excuse me, um, from the 30s, I, I need to get a glass of water. I'm sorry, I need to get some water. Be right back. Does someone want to like a musical uh, I'm, I'm or singing? Oh, he's back. Yeah, yeah. I apologize for that. Um, so anyway, uh, Joe basically took um, symbolic stuff. He was part of the Conchita Pueblo. And then he started making more modern um, uh, items. He started in the 1930s. He became very popular in the 1960s. And he um, uh, made his own uh, silver beads very distinctive. Um, he only used top quality stones. And uh, he kind of created a modern movement down uh, away from the Navajo Indian Reservation. Um, he, he worked in shops in and around Santa Fe and uh, 
Albuquerque. So he started creating a, a huge following. Um, he has a, a son uh, um, a, called a Sippy Crazy Horse. And uh, he also has a grandson that's taken over uh, his um, uh, efforts named Wadi. Um, both uh, um, uh, Sippy and Wadi are still active. Uh, they were at the Jean Autry. They're at um, the Santa Fe Indian Market every year. But what um, Joe did more than anything is that he sold this concha belt to a guy named Jim Morrison in 1967. And this was probably the most famous uh, piece of Indian jewelry ever put on display by a major celebrity. So Jim basically wore this thing until the time of his death. Um, and because Jim was wearing it, many of the artists of the day started uh, looking to buy uh, work from Joe and from other Indian artists. So I have photos where you can, uh, uh, Eric Clapton at Cream was wearing a squash blossom. Uh, Jimi Hendrix got a concha belt as well. But really it was this belt and Jim Morrison that really started to make this traditional Indian jewelry go outside the reservation and become a, a high fashion statement. This is the actual belt. Um, Pierre Cardin um, bought it uh, when Jim Morrison died. It was in, uh, he bought it in France out of his possessions. And it, it's said to be down at his um, uh, uh, famous uh, villa down in um, North Africa and I believe Morocco. But this is singularly the most uh, famous uh, piece of jewelry ever made. It was made by, and again, what you can see, it's a little bit different than normal Navajo in that it has this Danish quality where you can see that in the center part of the concha shells, it, they're plain. There wasn't a lot of um, dormant or stamping that was done. And so the whole effect was to kind of create a more simplistic, modern, fashionable style. It was these pieces that got the Wall Street Journal to get excited about this as a style. Ralph Lauren kind of came in in 19, early 1970s and started featuring this as well in his ads as part of you know the new American Southwest movement. But really, if you look at everything, it really goes back to this gentleman named uh, Joe Herrera Quintana. Um, and then the other family that we talked about is the Pontia family. They ran a gallery out of uh, Santa Fe and Tucson called Thunderbird. And uh, if you remember from my previous talk, Frank was originally from Sicily. He came in and hired some of the best uh, Native American bench people to work for him. One of the people that worked for him was Joe. So Joe got his, his tutelage under Frank and then was able to kind of take this style and bring it and make it his own. Um, what's interesting is Frank Jr. came around and continued the style and uh, Sam, which is the grandson, is carrying on this work. This is actually a piece done by Sam. So, but it's based on designs that his grandfather developed. So when we talk about modernism, in fact, the, the Native American um, uh, uh, people were already starting to do this work in the 50s and the 60s. But what you're gonna see though in a second is it took one magazine to kind of create a world stage for people to go um, in a different direction. So with that in mind, uh, this is the magazine that was the shot around the world. It was Arizona Highways. In 1974, in January, they did what was called the turquoise issue. And um, what they did is they featured many of the mines that were used in traditional turquoise. The other thing that they did is that they featured a few new uh, artists that they thought were doing uh, a new kind of um, uh, modernism. And this was in this magazine. And 
these things right now, you can still buy them on eBay. They're like $30 uh, an issue. But this was really kind of the shot that went around the world. And people realized that for the first time that this was something that was highly collectible. Um, they did a very good job at talking about the rarity of the mines. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a second because they were being depleted. And what this magazine did and what Ralph Lauren did and the Wall Street Journal did is they created a situation where su uh, supply could not keep up with demand. So when we look at all these events that took place in the 70s, there's really these things that I think that are profound. One is that people realized that turquoise and Southwest jewelry was a truly American product at the time, and it brought it to a world stage. Most of the turquoise though, uh, that was being mined came out of a byproduct of open pit mines. So turquoise has a curse in the fact that it's usually uh, found in areas that are very rich in gold or in copper. And so when they started to develop these open pit mines, turquoise was viewed as a byproduct. So they would literally take it out of the ground, crush it and smelt it for the, the mineral that they were looking to do. So when you look at this time when this boom hit, you had uh, the Blue Gem mine uh, was shut down and made an open pit mine in 1967. And that was the major source of turquoise to the Navajo people. No more after 67. Uh, Bisbee was a copper mine, uh, Phelps Dodge. Uh, they found turquoise there in 1953. They never officially mined it there. Miners were allowed to take it out with their lunch pails. Um, there was a huge open pit mine that was being developed out in Kingman that took out an area called uh, Ithaca Peak. So what you had is a really strange time as that turquoise became very, very valuable and all the major mines in Nevada and Arizona were just breaking it down and smelting it. So what was left was a lot of very small mines in Nevada and New Mexico that weren't really set up to meet the demand. And so what came out of it was a very enterprising gentleman who figured out that you could take all the low grade chalky material that was out in Kingman. And if you put it in chemicals like resins, you could, uh, you could change the composition to where it would pass to the unsuspected American as high grade turquoise. So literally what happened when this boom hit, there wasn't enough turquoise to supply it and in its place, what uh, came about was what this whole movement called treated turquoise. So when we talk about these jewelers and everything, what's unique about them is they never went to the treated side of the business, which was the mass market. Um, and then the other thing that happened is that once this Kingman turquoise became available, many non-Americans, um, I mean, non-Native Americans started making it. Uh, traditional Navajo jewelry. And so to kind of meet the demand. So you had kind of a really interesting situation that a lot of native artists um, basically kind of got pushed out from the good quality turquoise. And a lot of them got pushed out in, from a design standpoint. So when we talk about this new movement, understand it was really a direct reaction to these events that were taking place. What became um, in the 80s, 90s to present is that there's really been only three mines that were producing at large scale. Uh, one of them has since shut down, uh, but there were mines that were uh, opened up in China. Uh, you still have the original Kingman that's producing turquoise. And then there was a new mine in uh, Arizona called Sleeping Beauty. Um, and they fell victim to the Home Shopping Network because what happened is that all that turquoise was bought up by Ch Chinese, uh, cut in China and brought back to Home Shopping Network. So you, you, when uh, uh, Arizona Highways hit in 1974, really the boom lasted to 78 and it was all driven to the fact there was not enough turquoise to uh, maintain the, the movement that was going on. So turquoise and Native American jewelry became very popular. 
you can see a lot of these pieces are being brought back and uh, and market both at a, a consignment store level, uh, eBay and the like. But the reality is that there was very few artists that were trying to do quality work and tried to be different um, during this period. Um, the one person though, if you went in and you looked at that Arizona Highways magazine, off in a little corner in the middle of the magazine was this um, bracelet and this ring that was you see on the left. And that was um, put together by Charles Lolima. And we're gonna talk a lot about him, but he was uh, 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 the person that's really viewed as the person that changed the direction and tried to do something different. And so what you see over uh, at the right is a style that he called um, uh, cornrow or they're sometimes called corn cob. But what he started to do is doing some very sophisticated uh, inlay and um, very sophisticated um, use of colors and non-traditional stones. So what defined Charles Lolema is that he went out and found about this purple stone called Sugilite. He was the first person to bring that out. Um, he looked at um, uh, ironwood, he looked at fossil ivory. Um, he wasn't content to even look at traditional materials. There's a lot of pieces that he created that didn't have a single piece of turquoise in them. So this was uh, the man that, that I really admired because I was a young kid. At the time I was 15 years old, I was um, Celeste knows I was at Goddard Junior High at the Rock Hounding Club and learning lapidary. And I saw this bracelet and it literally blew my mind um, as a 15 year old. I couldn't believe that somebody was doing something this creative and, and this beautiful. And we're gonna talk a little bit now about Charles and the Rise, but he, he was a very unique man. He was born on the Hopi reservation, never left, always maintained a studio and a house on the reservation, was married to a uh, Hopi woman and was very active in his clan, which was the Badger clan. In the fifties, he went in, uh, into Scottsdale and Santa Fe and started uh, learning how to do watercolors and pottery. And then he met a young woman um, from uh, North Africa who taught him about this inlay and how to do these mosaics. And so he created this style uh, that was uniquely his own. And what was very interesting is that Lady Bird Johnson um, started to gift these to people. And uh, what it did is it brought him to a world stage very, very quickly. And so some of the people that were gifted these things were uh, 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 diplomats from J Japan, diplomats from France. And so, um, so in the seventies, he started when this boom hit, he was starting to get shows on a global basis. His uh, uh, main um, uh, gallery was actually in San Juan Capistrano, Capistrano uh, Gallery and Arts. And he had many shows there in the 70s. Um, these bracelets back then, I, I've told I went to one of his shows uh, because I was so, uh, so much admired his work from this magazine, I actually went down. I remember the show was more expensive than my Toyota Silica the bracelet. Uh, and so this guy was the guy that really went in a different direction. He was uh, picked up. He's reverend right now as really the Picasso of this new movement. And unfortunately, he died um, um, in 1991. Uh, he had a, a niece that took over the studio in 92. Her name is Verma, and she's still producing uh, this work under her stamp. But um, Charles is really, was the guy that really broke away and created this new movement. And this bracelet is very unique in the fact that unlike any other bracelet that you would see, he actually put the stones on the inside where you could never see them when the, the bracelet was worn. And his whole idea was that this represented your internal beauty and therefore only you knew what you were wearing and that the public didn't need to know about this. So he did some very, very innovative design things that really 
we're not so much even within the tradition of Southwest uh, jewelry, but global jewelry at, 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 um, as a whole. Um, this bracelet is also, uh, he was one of the first people to develop uh, the lost wax casting. So you can see on the outside is very richly textured. That was all done um, using a wax carving tool. Uh, he would cast these uh, bracelets and then uh, Verna would come in and do the inlay work and then they would sell these things. Um, this is an example of work that he did um, a little bit later in his life where he switched from silver to um, uh, 18 karat gold. Um, these pieces are very, very rare and very, very expensive. This bracelet right here in Japan um, would sell for about $100,000. Um, you would be lucky to find it here in the US for 40 to 60,000. So these were very much sold to the general public. Um, he had a few gal gallerists that represented him and it was really to the, to, um, you know, very rarefied uh, clientele. You can see the set of the rings here. He started developing this style where he had outsized um, stones. Uh, this is a very unique style that he uh, developed um, as well. And then again, you can see the use of lapis, coral, um, uh, sujolite. Um, so he's very innovative in the terms of the materials that he uh, uh, brought forth. Um, the other artist that was uh, featured um, in the magazine was um, another Hopi. His name was uh, uh, Preston Montague. Uh, he has a very unique story as well. Uh, he was active from, from basically the uh, 60s to 87. But he, what made him unique is that he was actually born uh, to a, a California Indian clan and he was uh, adopted uh, by the Hopi. So he, uh, he, and he was made a member of the Hopi tribe and started to learn the Hopi culture as a young man. But very, very unique in the fact that he wasn't born Hopi. He was actually brought into the tribe. Um, he perfected a method called tufa casting. And on the Hopi reservation, they have a very porous sandstone that they can cut and carve using dental tools to make these types of pa uh, patterns. And then they pour the silver directly onto the sandstone. And so he started this whole sand casting method. And then he uh, worked with a very accomplished uh, lapidary uh, person who would actually uh, cut these stones and then fit them in these troughs. So he created this whole vernacular of that kind of shadowed what Charles Lolama was doing with the inlay, but it was more about traditional technique. So these two people right here, you know, they, they kind of were featured in Arizona highways. They went to a world scale. They died, died quite young, you know, 87 to 91 respectively. But these are really the inspirations to the next set of artists that you're gonna see. And um, here's some more work that you can see of Preston. Um, on the left, you see a serpent um, design that's central to the Hopi people. And you can see on the right, um, um, storm clouds using jet and coral and turquoise. So again, very much a traditionalist, but when you look at it, it has a very modern aesthetic. It's not like any traditional um, uh, turquoise jewelry that was being sold at any trading post. And again, he was represented by high-end galleries. Uh, Boyd was one of the um, first students of Kenneth. So he actually went to community college, studied under Kenneth, and um, he created uh, a style that was pretty much a continuation of what Charles Lolomo was doing around the inlay. Um, what he brought into it though, was the use of uh, geometry. So all of the pieces that you see here have beautiful uh, inlay. Uh, he followed suit in the fact that he did not 
want to just feature turquoise. So he brought in fossil ivory, he brought in verisite, he brought in malachite, he brought in uh, lapis, he brought in coral. All of his pieces were done with very beautiful beadwork that he uh, would assemble as well. So he would do uh, five strand, seven strand, nine strand necklaces. And very much, you know, he was born in 1954. So at the time that this boom hit, he was only 20 years old. So when we talk about the passing of the torch, Boyd was really the first to basically pick up what Charles was doing in 74 and saying, this is going to be the style that defines me. Um, here's a traditional necklace that he did. But again, he uh, took the turquoise from many mines so that it, uh, the beading itself has very, very different stylistic than what the Navajo traditionally would have done where they would have featured beads from one mine. Um, he used turquoise from other mines and it was again this modern look of multicolors. He would space in this coral. Um, he started um, experimenting with uh, gold and, uh, and this very much came from Charles Lolama. And, um, but the styling that he uses is uh, using traditional uh, chiseling techniques using files to make these grooves in this, this turquoise. And that's what he learned from Kenneth. So it's a combination of, you know, being inspired by who taught him and then seeing what was in the marketplace, seeing what Preston was doing, seeing what Charles was doing and adapting it um, into his own style. Um, about 20 years later, um, a very famous book came out called Navajo Jewelry. I highly recommend that you find this because all the artists that came after Boyd are featured in this book. And um, it's really kind of a landmark um, if you want to know about uh, contemporary. But um, the one artist that I most admire that came past Charles Lolomo is actually brothers. And uh, they were born in New Mexico on the reservation, um, Ali and Raymond Yazi. And um, in the photo that you see here um, on the left, you see these barrel beads that have Australian opal, um, beautiful coral, lapis, uh, uh, all these uh, uh, beads were hand cut uh, by Lee Yazi. He was born in 1946. And then his brother became a master of inlay. So you see these beautiful um, uh, turquoise bracelets with this etching um, done through this chisel work. And so these were probably the best artists that came um, after Boyd. Um, they're so recognized for the genius of their work that the Smithsonian offered them um, uh, a show. Uh, it was the first time ever for a Native American artist to be featured there. They had over 300 e examples of their work. Um, and uh, it ran at the Smithsonian for a better part of a year. I actually uh, went and saw it. It's really just studying it. It had a, a, a beautiful name called the Glittering World. And um, this bracelet that you see here on the, the right was made by Raymond. And it has, I think, about 200 to 300 stones as part of the inlay. So you can see that there's like microscopic stones that are uh, all throughout it. Um, these individual pieces often would take him a year, a year and a half to complete. Um, and so a very, very stunning uh, work um, and to a level that nobody had ever seen before. And so it's not so much influenced by Lolama, but the fact that you could take this inlay and, and uh, do it at a microscopic level, um, uh, uh, this is what they're really recognized for doing. And again, just the finest quality stone that you could uh, bring into. These things, um, if you could find them, sell anywhere from 10 to $40,000. Um, and given the fact they had the Smithsonian show, pretty much every gallery uh, sold out on these pieces 
Raymond is retired and Lee is still working and Fetch is top dollar. This is a uh, uh, ring made by uh, Lee. So you can see just the level of the detail of the lapidary work, the gold work. Again, very, very detailed. Um, excuse me, this is not made by Lee. This is made by Raymond. Um, Preston, um, as I told you, was uh, Hopi adopted. Um, he had a relationship with a Navajo woman and who bore him a son. And he goes by the name of Jesse. Um, but he was raised uh, away from his father, raised by his Navajo mother. And he lived in a, an area called Two Gray Hills, which is in the center part of the reservation. And um, he was very influenced by his father, but what's very interesting is he was more influenced by Charles. And so this is a piece that's featured in the book from 95, and it's a tribute to Charles Lolama. So you can see that he used the kind of same spacing and, and inlay work that Charles did. What he did was um, add some personal touches. So he's one of the first um, artists to start working with diamonds. So you can see that in the bracelet and in the necklace, um, he has uh, uh, faceted stones. Uh, you can see that he has more modern designs like the turtle, the fish, the rabbit, jackrabbit, the lizard, um, the dove. These were all kind of brought. And he only worked in very, very high um, uh, level uh, uh, gold. So 14 and 18 karat gold. So he's um, still working today. Um, he's represented by Waddell Gallery in uh, Arizona. And he frequently sh uh, shows at these Indian shows. And again, one of the most collectible people and has you know, this amazing pedigree of having his father be Preston. Um, this is another example of his work. You can see what he's done is he's taken one piece of turquoise, uh, very thinly sliced it, um, added the coral insert, added lapis, added uh, ironwood, um, and then added fossil uh, ivory and did it in such a way, uh, again, uh, very similar to the cornrow pieces that you saw earlier from Charles, but very exquisite work. Uh, Rick Charlie um, is uh, another artist that came out of this uh, movement, and he kind of followed the, the um, standards that were set by Preston. So he started exploring this uh, use of uh, tufa rock. And so this design here on this bracelet, all the inlay channels that you see were actually carved using a, a, a dental tool into the sandstone, uh, creating the negative in which he poured the gold. And then you see on both sides, it picks up the porosity and the texture of the sandstone. And what, uh, uh, Rick started to um, uh, experience, experiment with was the use of diamonds. So you can see that uh, diamonds were set in these channels. He started using a non-traditional turquoise. So a lot of his pieces have lapis, a lot of his pieces have sujolite. And again, very, very exquisite um, work uh, done. And, uh, but all the technique was using the same technique that Preston developed. Um, of the artists that came out of it, another one was called Andy Lee Kirk. Um, he had a mixed uh, parents as well, uh, Navajo and um, uh, Pueblo, in New Mexico, his mother. And so he started uh, looking at a lot of the icon uh, uh, from the Pueblo tribes and then uh, started developing a very modern style using gold. And, and what you see is no turquoise in this. It was done strictly through uh, coral and through lapis and gold. Um, the eyes that you see in the earrings were made out of Australian opal. So um, unfortunately he died very, very young, um, as you can see. So he was, uh, but he's featured in, in uh, the 95 book. So here was a piece that was published there. 
You can see the Coco Pellis that were done almost as the headdress. See a beautiful European style leaf inlaid with Australian opal, beautiful beadwork. So he's more recognized as being equal parts European and Native American in his outlook. And um, uh, these pieces are very, very hard to find. I've actually um, uh, never seen one. Um, uh, and actually from a standpoint of uh, seeing with my eyes and touching. Um, but he definitely has a cult following. Again, if you're an artist, sometimes it's not bad to die young uh, because you have very limited inventory out here, but he's really one of these superstars of this new generation of, of jewelers. A uh, person that we met um, who was at um, the Gene Autry show two years ago was this gentleman by the name of Victor Beck. Um, he takes the traditional squash blossom, which was based on stones from the four corners. As I told you, the Navajo people believe that their world is divided in north, uh, south, east, and west. So he only features stones that are from uh, those areas. So jet from the north, abalone from the west, um, coral, and turquoise. And so very, very traditional use of stones, but he made it his own the way that he configured the beadwork, um, the barrels, the inlay, the use of gold. So he's ha had an amazing career that um, has lasted 35 years. And again, very, very um, uh, collectible. Um, he was one of the first to create his own website. You can buy directly from him. And again, just really super beautiful work. And like, for example, the necklace that you see on the right probably took him a good part of nine months to build. So there's not very many of these pieces out there because they're very uh, labor intensive on how they're built and how these, they're cast and how they're carved and, and uh, put together and assembled. And then the last artist that, um, who's still alive, and again, you can see him at these shows, was James Little. Um, he was born in 1947, still active. And he basically went the other direction where he started looking at this lost wax technique and started looking at non-turquoise. So all of his stuff never features turquoise. Um, he loves diamonds, he loves lapis, he loves verisite, gem silica. Um, and uh, he developed a whole style of making rings. And so you see the one that's kind of in the center of the necklace. These sell for about three to $4,000. And that's his principal design right now. Um, and it's been consistent for literally uh, 35 years. He's uh, stayed true to th this design element. So if you wanted to find the these people, and to collect these people. They're all pretty much out in the marketplace. Um, by far, Charles Lolama is the most popular. Um, uh, the earrings alone, the little earrings go for about $5,000. And then the showy, chunky uh, bracelets are now commanding upwards to 100,000. Um, the sad thing about Charles is because he's so collectible, there's a lot of counterfeit pieces that are out in the marketplace where people are replicating his stamps and trying to replicate his technique. The great thing is that Verna, who's still alive, can authenticate whether it came out of it because she did all the stonework. So she knows exactly what stones were featured in what years as these things were made. And um, if you go out on Pinterest, uh, be prepared to have your mind blown because I think right now there's over 500 uh, pieces that are out there right now. So very much the most creative. Um, the current artists right now, most of them have their own website presence. And then there's um, four principal galleries now that are representing uh, these artists. Uh, one is called Waddell out of Scottsdale. Another one is Shiprock out of Santa Fe. There's one out of Pittsburgh called Four Winds. And there's one called Garlands in Sedonia. So if you want to see current offerings, uh, all these artists are featured um, out of these galleries. And then uh, many of these people 
um, have booths at uh, uh, major Indian meetups at, in Santa Fe at the Indian Marketplace. And the Herd Museum in Phoenix always features these artists and welcome, welcomes them there. So again, very much a break of the new. Um, global appetite um, for these pieces, but very, very different than any Indian jewelry that you're likely to see at a, a tourist place or a trading post. So that's the end of this presentation. I'm going to stop the share and open it up for uh, questions. But uh, thank you for uh, listening in. Thank you, Richard. That was great. Amazing. Really I wish I'd seen this presentation before you and I and Mel went to the uh, the powwow in uh, the Indian market in Gene Autry last year, because uh, I would have had a, a much richer experience knowing what you've said tonight. <laughs> yeah, so four of the that was a great experience. Yeah, four of the artists were actually there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, I treasure the the two pieces that I bought. Uh, and uh, the inlaid work with the beads and whatnot uh, from Bird. Anyway, it was great. Thank you. Any uh, any question people have on on this work or the techniques or the style? I do have one question, Richard. Um, can you give us just some kind of thumbnail as to how to distinguish between processed turquoise <laughs> and a more natural stone? Yeah. yeah, so there's, there's uh, three things that you can do right away. A natural turquoise um, should have matrix in it, either uh, host rock or spider web. When you put your fingernail across the surface, um, the, the matrix should have a rough feel to it. If they've impregnated it with this resin or plastic, that plastic will go into the host rock and it will lose its porosity. So the first thing that you wanna do is what I call the classic surface test with your fingernail, is just run your finger across the, the piece. It should have an irregular feel to your uh, fingernail. Um, and um, you'll, as you touch these pieces, you'll get used to um, just closing your eye and running it through and, and you'll, you'll feel the irregularities on the surface. When they do the treated stuff, it, it typically is uniform and uh, uniform on the surface. It almost feels plastic. -y. That's the only way I could define it to you. Second thing that you wanna do is you wanna take a look in a hand loop um, because sometimes what happens is that you have within the turquoise, uh, when they put it in the chemicals, is that you have uh, areas that don't react to the uh, applied um, uh, um, material and you'll get these like spots of the white chalkiness in with the stuff that's treated. So what I can always see is when I see white flakes in the turquoise, it usually means that the solvent or the process, the vacuum process that they put through the turquoise uh, wasn't completely through the product. So it, it gets these really irregular uh, shapes. And then the third thing that it tends to do is it tends to change the luster. So it just has a plasticky uh, look. That's the only way I can describe it to you is if you see a, a regular piece of turquoise, it's usually very irregular in its color composition. So if I showed you a, a piece of turquoise that I have, it, it goes through gradients of hues. When they put it through this process and it, it changes through the treatment, it's usually a very consistent color. And that okay. usually doesn't happen in, in real life. Almost all turquoise that you see is uneven rather than consistent. The only turquoise that ever was mined that is a pure robin's egg blue was um, turquoise that came out of Persia and Sleeping Beauty. And um, those pieces are used for very, very fine jewelry because they don't have matrix, a very consistent color and it's this perfect uh, uh, robin's egg blue. But other than that, any other stuff, and I would say that 95% of the Chinese turquoise is treated 
Um, I'm hearing now Kingman is so bad that it may be up to 90% is treated. Only 10% they're selling as natural. And again, the, the turquoise changes as you um, go down. Um, uh, typically the best um, turquoise is found very deep in the mine where it's been under pressure and compression. Um, so actually they're still finding good quality turquoise in these old abandoned mines. They're going down 200, 300 feet. But um, uh, that's another thing is if you know about how the mines were developed over time, you can kind of date and make sure that it's consistent with the story. And so, yes, uh, Elaine, what can, can't hear you. Unmute. Um, ah, anyway, can you hear me? Yeah, I oh, can hear there you. There I am, yes, you can. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this before, but another way to identify, let's say, um, turquoise that's been reconstructed or regurgitated, what I call, blech, is that the matrix, has, there's no undercutting. There's no undercutting. It's like an ink line they put in there and the matrix is just flat. You know, there's no difference in the surface texture of it. You know, yes. and I, yeah, that's, that's no undercutting in the, in the composite turquoise that uh, some of it looks pretty good, but some of it's just disgusting. And one other thing I was gonna ask you was the name of the gal who owned the gallery in San Juan Capistrano was Sue and her last name began with an M and I don't remember. Sue. Yep. Mingus, who it was Italian. She was Italian. Yeah. I have a poster from that. I have the poster from that show. The poster I do from too. The, yeah. But is it Sonia Dora? I'm going to go find it. Oh, I have Sonia Dora, which was, she did a show with, our, with R.C. Gorman, you know, featuring all his stuff. But I didn't get to go to the one with, um, with the Native American stuff. But I mean, she, she's the one who had the gallery there. And, and my friend, did you know Irene who worked for Ortega's Trading, Richard? Uh, no, I, I, I've not met her. I did just you know, know her? the name. She was at Ortega's, Ortega's Trading Post, which is a touristy place, but she was there for 40 years. And she also worked for Sue. But Native American stuff, I've started collecting when I was like 10 years old. You yeah. know, so some of my stuff is pretty old, but uh, like me, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm vintage, not old. I like that one. Anyway, I, thank you. Yeah, that was yeah, quite I, some information. And also the students of um, La Loma, like, did you ever hear of a guy named Benny Armijo? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, Benny, Benny, so, you know, he does the same thing that you said. The beauty is on the inside. So he, he would set, I've got one of his bracelets that has the setting on the inside. And the rings too. They would set them on the inside because the beauty comes from within. Thank you. Thank you. Good presentation. Any any more questions? Yeah, Richard. Uh, one way that I can tell if I have real turquoise is that I find a small piece and I break it. Mm -hmm. And if the color goes all the way through, then you know it's true. It's not dyed. If it turns white in the middle, I know it's been treated and dyed. Yep. So that's another way. But that's raw turquoise, not something in a piece of jewelry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So just to, just to give you um, a general number, and it, it differs by mine. And so, but generally they consider only about five to 10% of what was um, produced um, at a mine level would be kind of natural high quality turquoise that could be used. And that's, uh, you'll hear that a lot, but the reality is is certain mines had uh, better uh, compositional host rock. Um, so where you see th that silica gets leached into the turquoise, it has a much harder um, um, Mohs scale. So right. what's weird about turquoise is that it, it, it can be very soft at three and it can go up to six and a half. And you say like, why is that? Well, it's the quartz that's in the, those host rocks as it gets leached into the turquoise and, and got reheated and reconstituted. There's certain mines that have higher quality 
turquoise. So one for me is blue gem. All the blue gem stones I have have a very high level of sil silica in them. Um, Bisboy, Bisbee is the most valued turquoise. It's $300 a carat um, if you can find it. Again, it all came out in a 20 year period in lunch boxes, but they were blasting every day. And so the guys would run through the blast piles and pick up the little things. Well, if you've ever cut any of the Bisbee turquoise, it's beautiful blue color and it, it literally um, blows up when you're trying to cab it because it's got so many internal fractions from the shock waves. So it's kind of an unusual um, situation that uh, how they've mined it, if they're not using explosives, if they're actually taking it out using um, uh, uh, hand techniques, they're mining the veins by hand. And that's what um, uh, Mel can tell you if you go up to uh, Royston, you actually can pull it right out of the side of the mountain um, and th they don't use blasting there. So that's the other thing that really dictates the quality. And then again, these open pit mines, usually what they would do is allow one operator in who could uh, work the mine under a contract. So they would set aside an area. Turquoise would come out. That's the case in uh, Kingman. That was the case in Berenci, where uh, there were just very small operations that were allowed to exist next to the main copper mining and gold mining that was taking place at those locations. Okay, well, Richard, like again, you know, it's a I'm great- I'm just gonna picture. share this, you guys. I do have the Loma poster. Yeah. It's from 1980, I believe it says there. Yeah, and I think, I think her name was Sue DeMayo or Sue DeMayo. Yes, yeah, Sue DeMayo. That sounds familiar, yeah. 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 So if you really want to see good, good um, uh, uh, Loloma pieces, they're all over in Tokyo. I, I used to go there on business and he was so esteemed over there. Um, you can, there's whole stores over there that feature his work. And it's crazy, the prices they get. You guys, I would, when I first started selling this stuff, I I had a little loam band ring that had his stuff on the inside and didn't know about it. I sold it for nothing. <laughs> uh, yeah. hey, you win some, you lose some. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm going to go grab a, a nice dinner. But as, again, thank you very much for letting hey, me. Too. Is anybody going to Quartzsite? Yes, many people. Yes. <laughs> okay. I am tomorrow. Kali, have fun. Where's Kali? Yes, me and okay. Mike are going this weekend. Night. Night. Take care. Night. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing, Night. as always. Awesome. Thank you. Very good. Awesome. Absolutely gorgeous stuff. Yeah. Such, okay. such Night, such everyone. Such information. Night, everybody. Night. 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 Be safe if you're going to Quartzsite. Be safe. Yes. Oh, yeah. Buy we'll something. We will. Buy Thank us you. Something. Sure. Bring us back a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> and we need the treats, though, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good, Gary. That's awesome. All right. <laughs> Bye. Let's take care now. Thanks. Take you care. too. Nice seeing you, Kali. Nice seeing everybody.